So I want to go back to kind of the relationship, what you get from other people and what it takes kind of to have those good relationships with other people, uh, what it takes to have a, uh, you know, I think you put it somewhere as a cultivating and maintaining, you know, these good relationships. And I know this comes from the talk you gave uh, at Ocon. So, and you said you got quite a few follow-up questions. I'm curious what those questions were. And, and what you think are the keys to kind of really be good at having good relations with other people? Yeah, so it's a big topic and a lifelong learning process to figure out what does it take. Right. Yes, yeah, you better get it right or you're out of the game. Yeah, no, it's another one that's not like that. So, and it's probably one of the hardest areas of life for the best people in general and perhaps particularly for the best people because the best people are the most individuated people in the sense that you know they have their own style and they have their own ways of doing things and they have their own mind and they want to assert it and usually they're not going to be identical in their styles and preferences and levels of understanding of different ideas or commitment to different ideas, right? So in some sense, the more cool and interesting a person you are, the harder it'll be for you in, in certain respects. And at the same time, I think then the more worthwhile and the more rewarding it'll be, and the more resources you ultimately have at your disposal, if you want to apply that same ambitiousness and, and problem solving acumen to really figuring it out. So what does it take? So, I mean, I could either answer at the level of really broad principles that are abstract and need a lot of flushing out, or I could give more particular tips that aren't universalizable. Uh, but I guess... Let's do a few principles or, or a couple of principles and then maybe a couple of tips. Sounds good. Okay. Because I know it's a massive, it's a massive, you know, you'll, you'll write a book one day. I hope to. Um, hopefully more than one, but hopefully one at least will be on this. Yeah. <laughs> so as far as broad principles, I invoke my talk again, uh, to some extent in that the, the major categories of focus that then all have their own tips within them are how to make your own mind known, how to communicate your context and and get the visibility that you need from a mind that can't read yours and is very different from yours and doesn't have your context that's one and the principle there in effect is objectivity except in a very difficult application of objectivity right which is to your own mind so to respect both your own context and the other person's context. That's kind of the next level down, like one onion skin layer down in terms of the specificity of the principle. But then there's still a lot, you know, that would need to be said about it. Um, so to respect other people's contexts and then to value other people, you know, we talked about how they're, they're actually, that other rational people or other people who share at least some of our values are, the most precious commodities that we have in life, spiritually as much as, you know, materially. And so just as valuing is active in the context of your career, in the context of you know, art, of whatever domain of goals you're pursuing, it is as ever active and requires your constant investment and energy and responsibility, you know, for growing that value when it comes to other people. Right, so again, this is the selfish approach. So if you really, if you see something of value in another person, whether it's that you just enjoyed spending time with them, whether it's that they make you laugh, whether it's that they have a way of thinking that you find really you know, insightful and generative, or they challenge you in ways that make you sort of improve or refine your understanding of things, you know, or you just think that they're really delightful for any, any of a million reasons why you might value someone, right, then act on that value, which means, you know, try to understand them and where they're coming from and ask them questions and learn how to listen, which is a whole art. And, 
and be curious about them and try to figure out, you know, what, what makes them this way? How did it happen that they got to be so bubbly and delightful? You know, what, what was their past like? You know, asking them questions, but also watching for cues that maybe they don't want to talk right now and, and honoring that even though, even if it's different from how you would feel in that situation, you know, so being an objective valuer, in effect, that's sort of the set of principles, but it's really complicated how to apply those principles in relationships. So a few tips. Okay. Oh, well, now I could choose from any of the million tips. Okay. So any particular, with respect to any particular with respect challenges? To these relationships, with respect to what you just talked about. Sure. Yeah. So, so I can invoke kind of the standard toolbox of assertive communication strategies. That'll probably be, a useful kind of one-off to go and research or to, to look up my talk or just Google assertive communication and maybe I statements because that's probably the core ingredient of the most different packages out there that will offer something good. So learning how to express what's on your mind in a way that doesn't assume intentions or assume um, obligations or motivations on the other person's part, you know, especially if there's a conflict. So if you're angry at someone being able to express that you're angry to kind of own your context and that you, you perceived an injustice here, or that you felt like they weren't taking you seriously, whatever the case may be, kind of expressing your experience in a way that gives them room to express their context relative to you. So rather than kind of engulfing them in your narrative and saying, you were being a jerk, you didn't care about me, you didn't think it was important enough to return my call, in which case now you're kind of preemptively forcing the issue. Well, if that's how they feel, then why bother talking about it? They're jerks and they don't care about you, so you might as well just you know, leave, find somebody different to talk to. But, but if you feel it's worthwhile to confront or to have a conversation with someone, then you know, you might as well let them kind of own their side of it. So, so there's a lot more you know, that could be said along those lines, but basically using I statements are just a handy way of kind of tracking that, that policy of, okay, so I own my context. I, if, if you're about to say something about them, you know, you, this and that, just think twice about how objective you're being and, you know, whether you're reading their minds. So, so that's one tip. Um, and just realizing how hard it is to know somebody's intentions and how often we mind read. I think that's another tip. Beware of mind reading. Yeah, we mind read all the time. It's, it's hard to avoid because what we have is our own context and it's hard right. to escape our own context. But that's what, that's what objectivity requires. That's exactly what objectivity requires. Exactly. And actually, I will add one tip now that I think about it to connect some of the different themes that come up. Be really value-oriented when you pursue relationships, which means look to the standard that you're judging people against and think about whether that's a standard that actually reflects the value you wanna get out of the person. So for example, do you need them to agree with objectivism in order to be able to enjoy their company, you know, or in order to be friends with them or to play music with them or, you know, and why if you do, and or what parts of objectivism and what is it, what difference will it actually be? Is it that they're gonna, steal the music that you made together because they don't believe in property rights? Like, is that something you actually see as a real you know, danger? In which case that's what you want to address. Or is it just that you're going to know that they have irrational beliefs that are lurking? In which case, who cares? You know, if Fork could love and be friends with Wynand, who was a murderer and had made Rourke's life a living hell for decades and Rourke just doesn't care, because he's just focused on the value that Wynand brings and the visibility he gets from Wynand, then you can be friends with a non-objectivist. Yeah. So that's just, I wanted to <laughs> throw that out there because it's a common concern. Yes.